I am really excited about today. I'm actually excited about this season or this time of year. It's one of my favorite times of the year, and the reason is not the reason most people love this. I mean, Thanksgiving and Christmas are nice, but I always get excited about this time of year because we come together as a church to show our community in a powerful and in a very public way. We do a lot of things throughout the year that aren't public, but we make this really public. In a powerful and public way, we show our community that we are for them. And there's a reason we do it publicly, and part of the reason is because people in our communities need to see. They don't just need to wonder. They actually need to see evidence and know that we're for them and we care as a church. And so we do that this time of year. And uh, this year we're taking it to an entirely new level, we're spending an entire month focused on this, and I'll tell you more about what that looks like and why we're doing that at the end. But first, I want to talk for a few minutes about why we do it. And for those of you who are newer around here and you've never been a part of this season uh, of our church where we focus on four, I'll explain to you why that is. And for those of us who have been a part, we all need reminders because we forget why this really matters so much. So I thought, I'd, let me just take a few minutes today to talk about why four matters so much to us. See, 14 years ago, there were seven of us who started this church, but before we ever started it, we spent 18 months, this is not going to give you any confidence in us, I'm telling you, we spent 18 months reading the New Testament and discussing and debating and then reading and discussing and debating, trying to find an answer to this question, and this is why you'll have no confidence in us. We tried to answer the question, what is a church? You're going, wait a minute, you started a church, but you didn't know what a church was. Well, to make it even worse, I'm a preacher's kid, so I should have known the answer to this, right? But, but we weren't looking for what's church like in terms of what we all know. I mean, we get that. We grew up in church. Here's why we ask ourselves this question and spent so much time reading the New Testament trying to figure it out. Because we knew what we were experiencing in church, and then we knew what we were reading in the New Testament, and the two didn't line up. So we thought, okay, there's a gap here somewhere. There, there's a disconnect at some point that has happened we know what we experience, but we'd like to figure out what church was actually intended to be. And then maybe we could start a church that reflects a little bit more, and that's no criticism of anybody, but reflects a little bit more closely what Jesus intended for the church to be all along. And in those 18 months, we had some, some interesting insights and some great conversations that really some of these insights have shaped who we are and what we do and how we do it. For 14 years now. I'll just give you one example. One of the things we discovered was this, that the church is a movement, not a meeting place. This is one of the things we figured out as we began to read. Wait a minute. Everybody today thinks about the church like it's a place. It's not a place. Jesus talked about the church, and the early followers of Jesus talked about the church like it was a group of people. It was a movement. It was not defined by a place at all. So for us, we've tried to build this entire thing around that concept. And here's what this, that looks like, and here's what I mean by this, and I think this will help you see the difference. If for some reason, you know, hopefully it doesn't, but for some reason this week a natural disaster occurred, and this entire building come next Sunday was gone, and all the stuff that we used to make this happen on Sunday was all gone, our church would not stop. We might not be able to meet for several weeks like this, but our church wouldn't stop because we have people, and many of you are a part of it, we have people who meet in small groups, in one another's homes all around this community every single week. And you know what? If we couldn't meet here collectively on Sunday for a few weeks, you'd keep right on meeting. You'd keep right on helping each other grow. You'd keep right on caring for each other. You'd keep right on connecting with each other. None of that would stop. And so many of you, you serve in our community. You serve in nonprofits. You serve people in your workplace. You serve people in your neighborhood. Well, none of that would stop. You'd just keep right on serving people and letting them know you were for them. And so many of you, you give generously and you give sacrificially. You wouldn't stop doing that. Not just our church, but you do it in our community in a lot of different ways. Well, you, you wouldn't stop any of that. See, we might not be able to do this, and there's value to this. But it wouldn't be like, oh, well, Journey Church doesn't exist anymore because they can't meet on Sunday. No, no, no. You just keep right on doing it because it's a movement. It's not a meeting place. This is also why, and for some of you, this may be new information, but we're right in the middle, and I'm going to have an exciting announcement in a couple of weeks, hopefully, about this. But we are uh, just starting to build our very first non-portable facility. And the number one question I have been asked is, well, Matt, do you think when we have our own building, I'm just afraid it's going to change who we are as a church? And I'm not worried about that at all, and I want to tell you why. First of all, because I understand this. This is true of us. We're not, a, we're not defined by a place. And so that building is not going to be any different than meeting in this building, or we used to be in the Curra Center, and we were in another building before that. It's not going to 
it's not going to be any different except we're having to pay for this next one, right? So I do realize there's that difference. But other than that, it's just going to be a building for us. Just like we use this building, we're going to use that building. So that's not going to be any different. But the other reason I'm not worried about it is because the building doesn't define us, does it? You define us. I define us. So every time somebody says, I'm afraid that things might change and the church might be worse, I just kind of chuckle because, and I, I don't usually say this, but I want to, but I come across like a smart aleck when I do, so I don't. You get that, right? So, but I want to look at them and say, well, are you planning on changing for the worse? No, well, I'm not either. So then I, I'm, I'm guessing our church will be fine because you're it, you know, and you're it, and you're it, and I'm it. So as long as none of us change for the worse, as long as we keep changing for the better, then our church is going to keep getting better. Because it has nothing to do with bricks and mortar. The church is a movement. It's not a meeting place. And so as we began the process over time of figuring out, trying to answer the question, well, what is a church? We arrived at a definition, and this isn't an official definition. I'm not even saying it's, it's it's definitely not the only definition. It's not the only right definition. But if you were to ask me today, well, Matt, tell me what a church is, here's how I would define it. A church is a movement of people changed by the resurrection of Jesus, and then driven by the command of Jesus. So a church is a movement of people that have been changed by the resurrection of Jesus, and we talk about this a lot around here. The reason I say that is because when Jesus died on the cross and they put him in that tomb, there were no Jesus followers left. There were Jesus admirers, but there were no followers. There was nobody sitting around going, don't worry about it, guys, no need to shed a tear. He told us he was God. He told us he would die. He told us he was coming back. We just got to wait three days. Nobody was doing that. They assumed it was game over. There were no followers. There was no movement. There was no church. The only reason we have a church today is because three days later he walked out of a tomb and all the people who had lost hope saw him with their own eyes, talked to him, had breakfast with him, had dinner with him, And said, oh my gosh, this is amazing. He really was who he claimed to be. And suddenly a movement began. And it only began because a man predicted his own death and resurrection and pulled it off. And the moment they saw that, they did something that makes perfect sense. They started taking seriously everything Jesus had said. Everything he said. Because again... If a guy can pull that off, you go, okay, whatever he said, I'm assuming it's true from this point on. So they took everything he said seriously, including this one command that he had talked to them about so many times over a three-year period. But he sat them down on the night of his arrest just before his death. He had his 12 disciples, his 12 closest guys, and he gave them this one command again and said, basically, if you don't remember anything else, you have to remember this. He didn't give them a list of commands. These were good Jewish boys. They practiced Judaism. They knew all about the list of commands. He said, no, 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 you don't need that list of commands anymore because I'm introducing a new covenant. I'm introducing something brand new. You don't even need the Ten Commandments. You've had those in Judaism. You don't even need those anymore. This one will cover all of those two. One command. And we've talked about this for the last few years over and over and over again because it is so central to this movement that we call the church. Here's what Jesus told him that night. He said, a new command I give you, inferring this is going to replace all the others. Love one another. To which I'm sure those guys are like, okay, got it, Jesus. We're, we figured that one out. We can move on. No, no, no. Jesus says, you don't have it. You love each other the way normal people love each other. You hadn't figured out what I'm doing. I am redefining love for you. He says, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. Not loving people who love you back, not being good to people who are good to you. No, no, no. Anybody can do that. I'm redefining love. Now, I want you to love one another the way I have loved you, and they had experienced that for three years. And then, think about this. They were about to see the ultimate demonstration of this unconditional supernatural love because just a few hours later, love was going to be hanging on a Roman cross in flesh and blood. And they would see and understand, wait a minute, this is very different than what we think of when we think of loving one another. This is love for your enemies. This is love with no limits. This is love to what we would say is the extreme. And that is love that we simply don't have the ability to do on our own, to which Jesus was going, yeah, that's right, that's my point. This isn't love like normal people love. This isn't something that comes natural. This is supernatural, sacrificial selfless love, and you cannot do it without God's help, without God's strength, and without God's power. 
But this is how I want you to love each other. Now, some of you, many of you, honestly, as we've talked about this over the years, you have been trying to learn to love this way, and you get how hard it is, don't you? You get exactly how demanding it is. You fully understand, oh, my gosh, I can't do this on my own. You know you got to lean into God to do this. They're just starting to figure it out. And then Jesus looks at them, and he says this. By this, everyone will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. In other words, this is to be the distinguishing mark and the defining characteristic of my followers. This love is so different. Don't miss this. This love is so different that it should stand out and get everyone's attention. This love is so different that when somebody sees it, they should go, okay, there's definitely somebody who follows Jesus because nobody but those folks love like that. And I don't even think I want to love like that, but I'm sure glad they're here loving me like that. It's that different. Which, by the way, is a great way for you to evaluate and for me to evaluate how we're doing at this. Because if our love, the way we love people, looks like everybody else around us, then we haven't figured this out yet. It's that defining and it's that distinguishing a mark. It's that different from what everybody else does. It's loving when no one else loves. It's going where no, one, where no one else goes. And Jesus looks at him and says, okay. The best way for you to authentically love God is to love one another the way I've loved you. And if you'll love the people that God loves around you the way I have loved you, then by doing that, you're loving God too. Because those are the people that he cares about most. So 14 years ago when we started the church, we thought, okay, We want to do everything we can, not to start a church that meets in a place and it's all about a location. We want to start a movement. We want to start a movement of people who are all centered around trying to figure this out. And we do not get it right all the time. We've gotten it wrong plenty. But the goal is not perfection because we're never going to hit that. The goal is progress. And so what we've done for years now is we've figured out ways to practice getting better at loving like this. And for the last several years, around this time of the year, we've just said, let's all come together and together practice getting better. We're working on it all year long, but we need some time to all come together and help one another get better at this. And the only way to do that is to practice. And so for the next month, this is what we're going to do. We're going to practice. And here in a few minutes, I'm going to tell you how we're going to practice, and we're going to make it so simple and easy for you to step in and practice with us. But the way we practice was inspired by something that the Apostle Paul wrote. So it was, I don't know, a couple decades after Jesus had risen from the dead. And Paul started churches in all kinds of different towns along the Mediterranean rim. And in one of those towns where he started a church, he's left a young guy named Timothy there to pastor that church. And Paul's mentoring or coaching him. And then he writes a letter back to Timothy. And he gives him some instructions, some advice, if you will on what he needs to do to better pastor or lead that church. And he actually tells Timothy how to get his church to practice loving one another the way Jesus has loved us. So I want to read you real quickly what he had to say, and then I'll tell you how we're going to do this over the course of the next month. Paul wrote to Timothy, and he said, Okay, Timothy, I want you to command those who are rich in this present world. In other words, Timothy, you've got people in your church who aren't rich, And then you have people in your church who are rich. And there's actually a different message you need to give the rich people from the non-rich people. So I'm going to tell you what you need to tell them. To which we all read that and think, well, that's good because I've been wanting to tell rich people some stuff for a while. I'm just not one of them. We all think that way, right? So this is, I do this every year, this is your annual reminder that you are actually rich. I know, I know, I know. You You don't even think you're rich. But you are. You're rich, and the reason you're rich is because of this. If you make $32,400 or more this year, you're in the top 1% of the world's wealthiest people. Every year, I read you the same thing, and every year, nobody gets excited and applauds. That was not helpful for you at all, was it? Nobody does. I'm just waiting for one year for somebody to go, Woo, I didn't know I was rich. This is awesome, but you're not. You know why you don't get excited over this? Same reason I don't, because you don't feel rich, do you? You are Rich just means you have a little bit extra, or maybe you have a lot extra, but you don't feel rich, and you don't feel rich for one of two reasons. You don't feel rich because you don't have any margin, so it doesn't matter how much money you make. If you have no margin, you never feel rich. You always feel stressed. You always feel broke. Some of you don't feel rich because you have no margin. Some of you don't feel rich because you compare. Like, you figured out how to have margin, 
but you still compare. And when I talk about rich people, you think, well, okay, I mean, I've got a little extra, but I don't have extra like. And you think of somebody, don't you? I read this, and you're like, well, yeah, $32,000, I barely make it on that. I'm not, you know. We're always comparing. Rich is the other guy. Rich is the other gal. Rich is the person with just a little bit more. I'm telling you, there may be different levels of richness, but pretty much all of us are rich by the world's standards. So if Paul were here, he would look at us and go, no, 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 I'm talking to you. You're rich. Let me see if I can explain it this way. Maybe this will help you see it. While none of us feel rich because we live in a culture where we're, you know, we're always comparing, somebody's got more, while none of us feel rich, here's what I know about you. If I could take you tomorrow to Haiti, or if I could take you to Bangladesh, in Bangladesh right now, you may not be aware of this, the largest refugee camp in the world is in Bangladesh. There's 1.1 million refugees in that camp. Imagine I could take you to a place like that. And I sat you down across from somebody who is a refugee or somebody who's living in Haiti trying to recover right now. And I said, hey, why don't you just go ahead and tell them about all the financial problems you've got? And you said, well, okay. And so you started to explain, hey, one of the big problems we have is that, gosh, we just have no margin right now. Money is so tight because we just keep spending so much money eating out. I don't know what we're going to do to fix that. I can't get it real brained in, but... Man, we just need to spend less money eating out. To which they would look at you and go, oh, excuse me, could you explain what eating out means? And you would explain it, and they would go, wait a minute. So you have enough money that you can hire somebody to cook your food, and then you hire somebody to clean up after you? And you'd go, well, yeah, I don't really think of it that way. But, yeah, but, see, I'm doing that too much. That's why I don't have any margin. And then you said, okay, here's another problem I've got. Like, I'm trying to figure out right now what to do at our house. And they'd go, well, wait a minute. You got a house? Yeah, well, how big's your house? You would explain your house and show them a picture, and they would go, oh, my gosh. You go, yeah, yeah, but I've got a problem. See, my problem is that in my garage, and they go, oh, wait, what's a garage? Well, it's where I put my cars, but that's part of the problem. I can't put my cars there right now. Okay, I'm sorry. So you have a, a roof over your head, but then you have a roof over your car's head? Like you built a house for your car? That's how they would think of it. And you would go, well, yeah, doesn't everybody do that? You don't have a, okay, well, never mind. Anyway, so, so in my house for my car, see, the problem is I can't get both my cars in there because we have so much stuff that's filling up my garage. So I either have to build another building to move the stuff or I have to build another garage and I can't figure out. And then they go, oh, wait a minute, you said cars. You got more than, you don't, just, you got more than, yes, we have more than one. Matter of fact, we have three and it's only a two-car garage, so I got to figure out because we don't want part. And then you would say, oh, the other thing is we're trying to figure out if we could add on because I need a bigger closet. So maybe if we just did a new master suite with a bigger closet. You have a closet? Yeah, what's in your closet? Well, all these clothes. I don't have anything to wear, but I have a lot of clothes in my closet. But I need to build a bigger closet because i got to get some more. You know. They would look at you, and again, you would never actually have this conversation, would you? Because if I put you in that setting, you would go, I, I don't have any problems. You would. I would too. I don't have any problems. Because it's all about perspective. Suddenly you'd go, I'm rich. I'm rich. But we live in our little bubble here where all of us are rich, so none of us feel rich, and we all think, you know, we've got our own problems and somebody else has more and they're rich. But you're rich. You are. And it's so important that you understand this and you have this perspective. Why? Because I'm trying to make you feel guilty? No, you should not feel guilty about anything you have. I'll explain why in a minute. It's not to make you feel guilty. It's because you need to be responsible. And if you don't understand and recognize and acknowledge that you're rich, you will never be responsible with your riches because you won't think you need to be. So Paul's looking at Timothy going, you got some people, and this is by first century standards. Can you imagine what they would say about all of us? He's going, you got some people in your church who have a little bit of extra. They got more than everybody else. So I want you to command those who are rich in this present world with material stuff. Command them, he says, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. This fascinates me because it's 2,000 years ago in a totally different culture, in a totally different economy, but the same thing happened then that happens now when people get a little bit more. We're all tempted to be arrogant. You know this. People who have more money just assume they're smarter than everybody else. 
And when you get more money, you think your IQ goes up with that. Let me help you. It did not. People next to you have been wanting me to tell you that. So there you go. It may have dropped. But we all think when we get a little bit more money that we're smarter. And if we're not careful, we'll get arrogant. We also think we're safer and more secure, don't we? Well, I got more now, so I'm pretty good. And you know what that looks like? That is us putting our hope in something that Paul says is very uncertain. But we're like, no, 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 I got it covered now. I got that savings and I've got those investments. Everything's good. And Paul says, no, 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 that's, that's not where, you, there's nothing wrong with it, but you shouldn't put your hope there. That doesn't make you secure or safe in life. You can lose all of that in a heartbeat. But we fall for this trap. It's dangerous. And we fall for this trap. And part of the reason we fall for this trap is because in our current culture, this isn't true in all places in the world, but in our culture, because we all have a little bit more we all live in what's called the cycle of accumulation. Let me explain this. The cycle of accumulation looks like this. Can you, some of you are here now, but most of you are past this. Can you remember when you were first starting out and you barely had enough to get by? I mean, it was scraping. You were, you were stretching food as far as you could stretch it, and you were stretching the, you know, the gas money as far as you could stretch it, and you barely had enough for rent. You can remember that, right? Some of you are there now. And then what happened as time went on and you started making a little bit more money? Well, as your income started to increase, you went from barely having enough to having more than enough. Man, I barely have enough food. Oh my gosh, I'm making a little more money. Now I got more food. I had one frozen pizza and I had to make that last two meals. Now I can buy two or three frozen pizzas. Forget it. You know, I'm just, I'm just going to splurge. You start having more. You barely had enough space, you made a little more money, and you thought, I'm going to get more space now. You barely had a car that could get you to work, you started making some more money, and you thought, no, I'm going to get a different car. Now. We've all lived this, right? But after you get more of something for a while, you realize, wait a minute, that's not really enough. That doesn't feel very fulfilling. We all do this. So then as our income keeps increasing, we shift from more to better. Now it's not enough just to have more of something, I've got to have better quality of that. I'll give you a simple example. I was just out of college, and I was working a job at a church where they paid me nothing. Literally, they paid me nothing. So I was raising my own money to work at this church in another part of the country, and I would barely have enough food to get by for the month, just barely. And one night at the end of a month, uh, some folks in the church asked me if I'd come babysit for them, and so I did. And uh, when they came back from their date, they'd been to the grocery store, which I thought as a 22-year-old, that is the lamest date ever, right? That's, that's all the married people laughing because now you find us in Kroger. So anyway, that's another series. So, so, we, so they had come back from the grocery store, and they come in carrying all of these grocery bags, and I start making fun of them. Because I'm like, are you serious? You went to the grocery on date? And they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's, we had to get our groceries. But we got you groceries too. And they had bag after bag after bag of groceries they bought. They didn't know I was out of food. And at least I didn't think they did. So they had bought all this stuff. But to illustrate this point, this is what got me really excited. And those of you who are college students, you will totally understand this. What got me so excited is they began to show me the stuff in the bag. And they pulled out Doritos. Name brand, like it said Doritos on the bag. I hadn't held that in a long time. I was doing flips in that place. I know that they were making fun of me then. They're like, it's Doritos. And I'm like, you know how much more of those are? than You know, everything they pulled out was name brand stuff. And I was like, I just graduated from more to better. This is incredible because there's a difference, isn't there? Forget the generic stuff, you know. I was so excited. We all do this. We all do this. Okay, I got a car. But now I'm making a little more, so I want a better car. I've got a house. It's enough space, but now I want a better house. We, you know, I was able to go on a vacation finally, and then I had enough to go on a couple vacations, more vacations. But now I want to go on better vacations. We all do this. It's part of the cycle of accumulation. It's just part of our culture. We don't even think twice about it. I'm going to get a little more. Then I'm going to get a little better. And then you know what happens after a while? Now, all of us don't end up here, but a few of you have. And we all know people who have. If you are fortunate enough that your income keeps rising to the point that you can move past better, then here's what you do. Eventually, better is not enough for you either. And you start trying to get different. Start trying to get different. 
Suddenly it's, okay, well, we used to do those vacations all the time, but now we got the money to go do that, and that's something different. Most people can't do that, but we can, so we're going to do that. Okay, I've got this car, and it's fine, but there's a different car, and I know most people can't afford it, but we can afford it, and we're going to go get different. This is, this is why you see people, like, you're like, oh my gosh, I love that shirt. Where'd you get that shirt? And they say, well, da, da, da. And how much was that? Oh, it's $1,000. And you go, you're such an idiot. Why did you spend $1,000 on a shirt, you know? If I just, if you've spent $1,000 on a shirt, I just insulted you. So I'm sorry. Didn't really mean to do that. But my point is, you just get to the point you have enough money, it's like, okay, well, I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not doing better anymore because that's not doing it for me. I think I need different. I'm going to go spend $1,500 on a pair of shoes, $1,000 on a shirt. I'm going to go spend ten grand on that vacation. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with any of this. I'm just saying you need to be aware. This is what happens. And if you are or you know somebody who has enough income, they've gotten to this point, you know what they do? After a while, that's not doing it for them. And they decide they need to get more of different. And then after a while, they will try to get better of different, and the cycle will just go on and on and on. Now, the reason I bring this up is not to make you feel guilty. The reason I bring this up is because you need to be aware, because if you're not careful, if you find yourself in this cycle of accumulation, you will keep searching for fulfillment and happiness here. And it's never here. And you will find yourself putting your hope in something that is very uncertain. You'll put your hope in something that does not deliver. This is what Paul was driving at. He's going, you rich people, you have temptations other people don't have because you've got a little bit more, so you can drop into this cycle and get in this loop again and again and again, and people who are just barely getting by, this isn't even on their radar, but it is for you rich people. That's all of us. So Paul's telling Timothy, you got to tell them, watch out for this, and you got to tell them there is a better way. And here's the better way. He says, but I want you to tell them to put their hope in God. We don't have time to talk about that, but you know how you put your hope in God? You take your blessings, you take your resources, and you actually move them in God's direction. Because wherever your money goes, your heart follows. Wherever your time goes, your heart follows. So he says, you just tell them to put their hope in God by shifting their blessings in God's direction. Who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. This is why I said you shouldn't feel guilty about what you have. Because you're not the ultimate reason you have it. I know you worked hard, and I know you saved, and I know, I don't know, I got all of that. You went to school, and you got the degree. I get all that. But you're not ultimately the reason why you have it. You have it because you have a good and generous Father in heaven who chose, for whatever reason, to give you or allow you to have what you have and to allow me to have what I have. And there are people who are more hardworking than us, smarter than us, in places all around the world, who for whatever reason, they have not had placed in their hands what you and I have. So Paul says, you need to understand, first of all, the source of everything you have. You're not owning it. You're just there to manage it. It could disappear in a moment. And this is good news. It's why you shouldn't feel guilty. Paul says, you need to understand that God put these things in your hand to manage, to steward, and to enjoy. So don't feel bad about what you've got. It wasn't ultimately you that got it. God chose to allow you to have it, and it's okay to enjoy it. But you also have to be responsible with it. And so he says, Timothy, I want you to tell them they have two responsibilities with all the extra God has placed in their hands. And here it is. He says, command them to do good to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. I'll just summarize what Paul said this way. He's saying, because I have more, I should do more, and I should give more. Because I have a little bit extra, I should do a little bit more. I should give a little bit more. That is my responsibility. Now, you have more of the two things that are most valuable, and so do I. We have more time. And the reason I know we have more time, you think you have no time, but you don't have to work seven days a week just to keep food on the table. There are a lot of people in the world who do that. So you've got some discretionary time. And Paul's saying to Timothy, tell them God gave them that extra time so they could enjoy it. And it may be okay to enjoy some of it on themselves, absolutely. But they should also enjoy some of that time by doing 
good with it in a way that other people can't do because they don't have the time. And figuring out ways to use their time to help those people. To use their time to serve and meet that need. He says, you got to understand, because you have more, you should do more. You should do more good. You should be richer in good deeds than other people. Not because you're a better person, but because you've got more opportunity. And you should give more because you've got extra resources. Sure, enjoy some of it, but also use it to meet those needs and to help those people. What Paul's trying to get at here is not that you should never enjoy anything you have. What he's trying to get at is he's trying to help all of us rich people think differently about our riches. See, we assume whenever a little extra comes our way, we assume it's for us. It's the assumption that this is all for my consumption. And you know this is true, just like I do, because what's your first thought when you suddenly discover that you're getting a bonus or you suddenly discover that some money is coming your way or you're getting a raise that you didn't know you were getting? What's your first thought? Our first thought is usually, oh my gosh, how am I going to use this for me? And we start making a list. And Paul's going, whoa, 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 see, you've fallen into the cycle of accumulation trap. You're looking for more, better, and different immediately. He says, no, no. Just have a different perspective. Just look at whatever extra you have and go, okay, this is God's, not mine. He allowed me to have it. So I'm not going to start by assuming it's for me. I'm going to start by saying, God, what do you want me to do with this? And if the owner of it looks at you and says, enjoy it, you enjoy it. And if he says, save it, you save it. And if he says, invest it, you invest it. And if he says, spend it, you spend it and you enjoy every minute of that. But if he looks at you and says, I want you to use that, some of that extra time or some of that extra money to do good and to be generous, you do that. And you enjoy it that way. But you're not assuming, I'm not assuming, I can just do whatever I want to with this. Because if that is your assumption, you will live in the cycle of accumulation forever. The problem is, it is not fulfilling enough. It's why Paul wrote this next. He said, Timothy, tell them in this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. So he's going, they don't even realize it, but if they'll manage what God's given them the way God wants them to manage it, he's going to reward them for all of eternity for that. So that they may take hold of a life. And this phrase I just think is phenomenal. So that they may take hold of a life that is truly life. In other words, Paul says, I understand what's at the root of all this. What's at the root of all this is we all want to live a life that's fulfilling. We all want to be happy. We all want to be, uh, live a life that's meaningful. We all want to find the path to purpose in life. But he said, when you're rich, you have options other people don't have, and you fall into traps other people don't fall into. You assume fulfilling is the cycle of accumulation. You assume if I can just get more, then it'll be fulfilling. If I just get more, I'll be happier. And then you're not, and so you try better. And then you're not, and so you try different. And you just keep going again and again and again. But this is not, this was Paul's point. This is not where you find a life that is truly life. There's nothing wrong with having more. There's nothing wrong with having better. There's nothing wrong with having different. There is something wrong with assuming that that's yours and it's the path to true life. He says, you want to find fulfillment? It doesn't come through more, better, or different. There is a very different cycle you need to start living in. The cycle of significance looks like this. I give, I serve, and I love. God's given me extra. Okay, God, what do you want me to do with this? How can I give? How can I serve? How can I love? This is how you take hold of life that's truly life. Now, you know this already. And the reason I know you know it is because... You know someone, just like I do, maybe several someones, that anytime their name is mentioned, this is what you think of. You immediately think, oh my gosh, they're such a giving person. Oh my goodness, they, they serve so many people. They are so loving. You know some people who are known for these habits. And you also know they live a life that is so fulfilling. You know they've, they've figured out their purpose. You've just never connected the dots. It's because they're in this cycle instead of the cycle of accumulation. And Paul's going, no, 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 you got to be aware. you got to be responsible. you got to pay attention. Because this is the path to purpose for all of us. Enjoy what God's given you. 
but don't assume it's for you. And when he asks you, you give, you serve, you love, you give, you serve, you love, you give, you serve, you love. So, every year about this time, we come together as a church and we say, you know what, we need to practice getting better at this because it's hard. And you forget and you fall back into the, you know, more, better, and different, more, better, and different. So this year we're going to do something a little different. We're going to focus the entire month on getting better at this because I think we all need it. I know I do. So what's going to happen is this. Next week we're going to practice this give component. We're going to receive our Christmas for Calway offering. If you've never been around here, I'll just give you a short synopsis. I'll give you all the details next week. But basically what we do is we all give as big as we can possibly give and then we turn around and we give all the money away to meet causes and needs and to help nonprofits in our community go further faster. And next week, I'll give you all the details of where the money's going, but we give every single penny away. And the thing I love about it is we're not giving it away in such a way that it makes a difference today, but then it's just gone. You know, it's like, okay, well, that helped today, but not tomorrow. No, we're giving it away where it meets needs today, but it's having an impact for years to come at the same time. It's been phenomenal for us to do over the years. It's such a great way to show our community that we're for them. So next week, we're going to do that. Need to be here next week for that. You can go ahead. I think it's live already on our uh, giving platform. So you can go ahead on our app if you want to give this week. Just choose Christmas for Calway Fund. And we'll give as much as we can possibly give back to these nonprofits in our community and back to meet needs and to help people who are dealing with hunger issues, with housing issues. We're going to help children at risk in a lot of different ways. We're going to help people who are in recovery from addiction. Those are the causes we're going to invest in. So I'll tell you all about that next week. And then two weeks from today, and we've never done this before this way, two weeks from today, we're going to focus on this serve piece. And so we're going to spend a week practicing getting better at serving, taking a little bit of our extra time and being rich in good deeds with it. So in two weeks, we are inviting some of the top nonprofits in our community to join us I'm so excited about this because, one, we're going to get to celebrate them and all the incredible work they do. But we're also going to carve out some time in our service for you at the end to be able to go interact with all of them because they'll all be set up up here. You can find the cause or the nonprofit that's meaningful or passionate, uh, that you're passionate about. And we want you to go talk to them and say, okay, I'm willing to give an hour of my time at some point between now and the end of the year. What do you need me to do? And we're going to make it so simple for you to figure out a way to go serve and to give back and to show the people in our community that we're for them. And then the last week of the month, the last Sunday of the month, we're going to focus on love. And I'm so excited about this. I'm not going to tell you what exactly what we're doing, but we are going to create such a simple way for you to celebrate and appreciate the heroes, some of the biggest heroes in our community. And you'll have to be here on Sunday, that Sunday to be able to do it. So what do I want you to do? Two things. Number one, I want you to show up every week for the next four weeks so you can track with us because you can't get better if you don't practice and you can't practice if you don't show up. So let's all get better together. And then the other thing I want you to do this week is simply this. I want you to ask yourself two questions. First of all, ask yourself the question, what do I want to be known for? This is so important. Matter of fact, I hope you will write the answer to that down. Just pull out your phone or a notepad or your laptop, whatever. And carve out a little bit of time to really think through, okay, what is it I want to be known for? In other words, when my name comes up in a conversation, what do I hope people immediately think about me? You need to, some of you have never done this. You need to write that down. And then once you've done that, I want, to, I want you to ask yourself a second question. And this is a harder one. This is a more painful one sometimes. But I want you to ask yourself, okay, what am I known for? This is who I want to be. This is who I want everybody to see. But what's the reality of who I am? And where's there a gap? And the gap creates a little bit of pain, doesn't it? Because none of us want to acknowledge there's a gap. But you need to know there's a gap so you can close it. So ask yourself, what do I want to be known for? What am I known for? And then just engage with us over the next month because we're all going to practice together figuring out how to close the gap. Because here's what I know. Whatever you write down in terms of what you want to be known for, in the end it could be summarized by, I want to be known as a person who's generous with my money, generous with my time, and generous with my love. You want to be known for this. So let's all get better at closing the gap together. For far too long, the church, you know this, the church has been known for what it's against 
And even worse, the church has been known for who it's against. We want to be known for what, and more importantly, who we're for. It's why we started this church 14 years ago. We have to keep getting better at being a movement of people who love the people in our community the way Jesus has loved us. And it takes practice, and it takes focus, and it takes work. I'm telling you, it's worth it. You know why it's worth it? Because the only way we can be that as a church is if you are that individually, and I am that individually. Because we are the church. So if you want us to get better at this, you got to get better at this. If you want us to make progress here, you got to make progress yourself. You're responsible. So am I. But the better we all get individually, the better we will be collectively. And you, you don't want to be a part of a church that's all about themselves. If we ever become that, then none of us will like our own church. We'll all leave, won't we? But in order for that not to be true, we keep, have to keep getting better and better at giving and serving and loving. So we're going to practice individually, and we're going to practice together for the next month. So that there is no question, no question from anyone in our communities, there's no question about who we follow. Though no, there's somebody who follows the one who died and rose again to pay the penalty for our sins. There's someone who follows Jesus, the one who invited us to call him Savior and leader, and this is amazing, friend. Oh my gosh, look at how they love. Okay, I don't believe everything they believe, but oh my, they've got to be somebody who follows Jesus. We've got to learn to love that way. So nobody in our community questions who we follow, and no one in our communities doubts who we love. We love them, and them, and them, and them, because God does. And we're going to love the people that he loves. We're going to be for the people that he's for. And they're going to be able to tell God's for them because they're going to see we are. And they're going to see his grace and his love through us. That's what it means to be for. That's what we're going to do this month. And I'm excited for us to do it together. Let me pray for us. Father, those are such hard questions to answer. So would you just help us to have clarity around who we want to be and what we want to be known for? But then also help us to have enough courage to answer the question, okay, what am I actually known for now? And help us to own whatever the gap is. It's the first step to changing. We've just got to acknowledge it's there. So help us to figure that out. And then help us together for the next four weeks to practice getting better at loving people the way you've loved us. To get better at giving. God, I can't wait to see the impact that is made through all of us when we decide to come together and pool our generosity to meet needs and to help these organizations go further faster. Help us to get better at that. Help us get better at serving. Not just every now and then, but literally it's who we are. So it's what we do every day at the workplace, in our neighborhood, at school, wherever we may be. Most of all, help us to get better at loving the way you've loved us. Thanks for loving us that way. Thanks for setting such an extraordinary example. And thanks for being willing to give us the strength and the power to do this when we can't do it on our own. We lean into you and ask for that help. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.